It was just fabulous good fortune that when the music industry itself was changing, I started working in it, and that was great. And I think, for me, what was fascinating about it is that, you know, when you make a gift of music, that 12-inch album was a fantastic gift. You, a download isn't really a gift. And a ticket to a concert may be a wonderful gift, but it's ephemeral. You know, a lasting gift of music is the vinyl. And if you add in art to that equation, it makes for it that much better a gift. And I, I was fascinated and enthralled with that process. Both music and art are gift cultures. That doesn't mean they're free, but it means that, you know, even if you spend a lot of money on it, it makes a great gift and that was at its beginnings when I started it became a sort of crescendo of creative effort for all concerned and and the musicians were frantically thinking about recreating alternative worlds and to be part of that creative process was lovely it was great fun and I think it was it was inspirational to a lot of people you know the, the music and the art and wow this is great so yeah I think it turned people on to possibilities that they might not otherwise have had and you know it I went to art school I don't know 15 years after the end of the Second World War is a pretty bleak place pretty gray everything was <laughs> Yeah, and you know, by the time I finished, it was like really colourful and changing. Again, mentioning that dreadful word, the Bauhaus, there is a complete antipathy to decorative work from the Bauhaus. You know, everything stripped down to basics. And when I was a student, I actually met and and went to a lecture by Gomrich, and he was being incredibly snooty about decorative surfaces and said. You know, there's no merit in them anywhere. Uh, it's all secondary art. And I thought, you couldn't say that to a tiger, you know, or a leopard, or even an army tank. You know, markings on the surface have a role. Look at a parrot. That's not camouflage, but it's part of the essence of the, ca of the parrot. And I wasn't satisfied with that at all. So I'm very much interested in color, markings, patterns, shape and form and if there is no reason why I have to do it this way I will go for something that has a natural look and feel absolutely yeah but if you look at what I do when I do album covers a lot of my architecture has ended up in album covers um, and it's for me it's a great way to show it off it's a great way to say to someone you know have a look um, it made a difference to me too, because I've sat in front of clients and they've asked me three questions. Will the public like it? Won't they think this is a bit weird? That's one. Is it possible to build? Two. And if we can build it, won't it cost the earth? And over the years I've been able to show, look, you know, 10 million people bought this and I've got an engineering firm I've worked with, including I've worked with Mott McDonald's who did the uh, Sydney Harbour Bridge and they've said yeah we can build this for this amount of money so I can say it can be built it can be built economically and the public reaction is very positive other projects that have appeared on, on album covers I did a design for a hotel for Darling Harbour <laughs> it never got built unfortunately but that ended up as a album cover for yes a design I did for a spa which I'm hoping will be built was a cover for Steve Howe's first solo album. So I have merged and purged. When I work on architectural projects, I have a friend who has an architectural firm and he keeps them employed all the time because I chop and change. You know, I, at any given time, we're doing one or more architectural projects, but I'm also working on things like musicals, uh, stage shows, uh, films. We're working on a film about the future based on the book, The Optimist Guide to, sorry, The Optimist Tour of the Future. Um, so I can't really afford to have people who are focused on one area if I'm not.
I suppose the single most common question I get asked, and I'm sure it's true of everyone in, on, on the list of speakers, is where do you get your ideas from? And I had a conversation with a musician called Ramesses when he was making out, uh, talking to me about designing an album cover. And the journalist said to him, at Ramesses, where do you get your ideas from? And he said, when I'm sitting like this, they come from over here. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and I thought, well, I laughed like you. And then, I, you know, that is exactly what it feels like. You know, um, ideas come fully formed and instantaneously. Or the other way they come is you, you know, you slug them out, you analyze, you just beat it out of them, and you, you work analytically and critically. And I discovered that you actually, as human beings, you work both ways. You look at a problem, you analyze it, and you, you know, you just hammer it out. But the other way, which is much more exciting and much more inventive, is you get ideas. Now, it happens to all of us. The tragedy is, they're so often stillborn. So, uh, you know, in an educational situation, what we have to do is A, make sure we get appropriate ideas when we need them, and B, have the facilities to take those ideas out of your head, onto the paper, and onto the street.